What is up, everybody, and welcome to the All NBA Show, part of the All City Podcast Network. I'm your host, Adam Matez, and I'm joined once again by my esteemed colleague, Tim Legler. Legs, we did the West. Now it's time to head to your neck of the woods, the East. Yeah, look, we had the wild, wild West, uh, and I think the the roster and the rotation, the bullpen was deeper in the West in terms of yeah, that's right. True. In terms of like these top tier, intriguing type teams that also are going to be very, very competitive. Um, and it's a little bit of a shorter list in the Eastern Conference, but I think the top of the East is fascinating. There's been some changes, some really big changes on some of these teams that are trying to narrow the gap with Boston. So let's get right into it. So it's funny, man, because you said the top, but I'm not even sure what the top is in the Eastern Conference. Boston, clearly the reigning champs, best team last year, no question, but they have injuries this year. So are they at the top? But as we did last week, we're doing most interesting teams, not necessarily the best, but most interesting and whatever that means to each of us. And we're going to start with the New York Knicks, the team that made a blockbuster trade a week and a half ago. They bring in Carl Anthony Towns. They send out Dante DiVincenzo uh, and Julius Randle. And so now they have a center and a very dynamic one. First off the top, what's your big picture thought on adding Carl Anthony Towns? Yeah, I mean, look, you you just basically filled out, I think, a team – that was maybe a piece away from being really complete offensively um, and adding a, a player like this, a seven footer that you can run your offense through at times, uh, you know, a proven scorer in this league, proven spacer and shooter that can run really dynamic pick and pop games with Jalen Brunson, who's as crafty as anybody at utilizing ball screens and in drawing the second guy, and then Carl Anthony Towns using his shooting ability to make teams pay off of that. Um, I didn't think Carl Anthony Towns uh, had uh, didn't look to me like there was a comfortable chemistry there in Minnesota. That was just an outside observer. You know, could be dead wrong about it, but that's just my take on it. My gut was telling me so. I wasn't surprised that he might end up in a different place. I'd never saw New York coming. I didn't think they'd be able to get into the mix. And I think they paid a pretty heavy price for it in Julius Randle and Dante DiVincenzo. Um, and with Randle coming back and really trying to find out what this team was going to be with him. And the DiVincenzo had the best year of his career by a mile yeah. a year ago. And a lot of shooting and toughness and a very good defender. You lose that and you roll the dice on this, man. And one of the most multi-talented you know, bigs offensively in this league. And I think that the Knicks look at it like, hey, we added Mikhail Bridges. We added – last year we added Ananobi. Now we're adding Carl Anthony Towns to go along with Jalen Brunson, who's going to be on some people's preseason, like MVP top five lists. Right. And you got now, I mean, you could make a really strong argument that you might think this might be the second most talented overall team to, to Boston in the Eastern Conference. And that's that's the kind of level uh, talent level that he has. Philadelphia would have something to say with that as well. But I just think they might have a little bit more depth of offensive talent on this team than Philly has. So I think that they – look, they went for it. They had a great year last year. They energized the city. They energized the league in a lot of ways. They really the did. As good as they were, they completely fell apart physically at the end of the year. So we don't really know what their real end of their season would have looked like. Uh, they ended up getting beat by the Pacers and uh, just literally walking wounded when the series ended. And now you come into this year, hopefully everybody – I mentioned it's healthy. You're going to miss Mitchell Robinson for a few months, but now you've got big – the Carl Anthony Towns that you can roll with right away. And Adam, I think this is a dangerous team. Jalen Brunson, Mikhail Bridges, OG Ananobi, yeah. Carl Anthony Towns, and then whoever you want to put at the four, whether that's you want to put Josh Hart and play four Probably. wings or whatever you want to do, that is some serious talent in your starting lineup. It really is. And, you know, it's funny because this is another team. We talked about Dallas and Minnesota. Lots of success last year, and then they change it up. You know, rather than build on that, go for continuity – you mix it up and have a different identity. This team has a different identity than last year's too. Last year's team was dogs. You know, they were they were gritty. They were physical. This team, you add Carl Anthony Towns, and now you have a little bit more um, – it's more dynamic on offense. I think this is probably the most spacing Brunson has ever played with, and look at how good he was last year operating and finding seams in the defense and playing the way he did. But now you're talking about OG Ananobi, Mikael Bridges, uh, Carl Anthony Towns. That's elite spacing that you could put around him. And I just think he's going to have another monster year, probably even better than the year he had last year because Carl Anthony Towns is one of the best pick and roll or pick and pop partners you could have given him to create 
an opening in the paint. Yeah, and look, he's there's going to be adjustment, and and you know this is what the Tibbs is going to have to figure out because Jalen Brunson's usage rate is just through the roof, and it, it actually was just expanding in the playoffs. I mean, there, yeah. there was there was possession, there were games I watched where possession after possession after possession it started and ended with Jalen Brunson, and so with Carl Anthony Towns, yes, you had some isolation play with Anthony Edwards, not the same as your point guard. Mike Conley certainly doesn't play that way. So as your point guard to play the way Jalen Brunson plays, that's going to be an adjustment for Carl Anthony Towns as well. But I think it's going to be a welcome one. Uh, look, he, you know, he, he, he grew up in that area. So that's right. probably exciting for him. The energy and the electricity that he's going to be walking into and the expectations of this team, I think there's something that he's going to, you know, get a lot of adrenaline from. But you know what else comes with that, Adam? A lot of pressure. Right. And Carl Anthony Towns did not finish his season well. He really struggled in that series with Dallas, could not make a shot, was was like a glaring hole for them offensively in that series. And that's how his season ended. And now he's going into a market where it's just much more significant night to night what happens with you, the media coverage, the fan reaction, all of that stuff. The expectations are really high for the team. They're super high for him. And now that this is going to be a level of pressure that he has not dealt with uh, to this point in his NBA career. So we're, you got to find out, is he built for it or not? Like you just never know. Jalen Brunson came to New York and he – embraced it is clearly built for that kind of stage that kind of attention that kind of pressure and responsibility we got to find out if carl anthony towns is because it doesn't compare what he faced in minnesota with what he's going to face in new york and that is a i think a big element in this that we're all going to have to sit back and wait and see how real is this by the way legs like you know there's some some cities that are just different the fan bases are different boston new york philly is one of them in your experience were there really players role players or stars that would tell you like, Hey man, that was just tough. Like I didn't enjoy that experience at all. And that was, and you saw guys that, Hey, it's not a New York guy. No question about it. Yeah. It's, it's a real thing. And I think there, you know, there, there are guys that have played that I've known that, have, that have played on some of the teams uh, in some of the cities you just mentioned in Northeast corridor cities for the most part Yeah, that welcomed a nice little 10 game, 10, 10 day road trip, man. Like, <laughs> Get away. Like, Get me, get me out. Like, get me out to let me go. Let me go get that Portland, Sacramento, yeah, you know, a uh, Utah road trip. Let, let me get that, man, and find my shooting stroke again because it's it's just different. And I will say this: like, I really believe this in my heart. Like, and there's a lot of great environments in the NBA. Um, I don't think there is any environment that is as all encompassing and electric as Madison Square Garden when the Knicks are playing well. Yeah, uh, it comes. We saw that through, last year. It comes through the TV. It like really that's does. what I mean. Like it translates to you as just an observer, fan, analyst, whatever, watching the game at home or in the studio. It translates through the screen. And even though I've been in some of the great arenas in this league, Denver's one of them. Golden State's one of them. Like I've been there and they've been really good. And like you feel it when you're there for sure. You don't feel it as much watching. You yeah. feel it in Madison Square Garden. Yeah. And and so, like, it's great when you're playing well. You don't think, right, that felt good to Dante DiVincenzo and Josh Hart right. and Jalen Brunson last year at the end of that year. I mean, my goodness, imagine those guys walking into any restaurant or bar in the city with what was going on with the Knicks. It, but th it's the opposite if you're struggling. And I'm not saying you're going to walk into a restaurant and get booed by the people eating their steak. But what, what's going to happen is the, there's so many different people covering the team in those in those outlets, TV, print, digital media, that they they man they they are on you yeah. when you're struggling, and and that's what can start to carry a lot of burden. You try to tune it out the best you can. That is a level of scrutiny that Carl Anthony Towns has not dealt with to this point, and that is that is going to be it. Now look, if he plays well and they're rolling. Hey, he won't have any problem. But, the, but really, the final answer is going to be, can you do this for three rounds in the Eastern Conference playoffs? Yeah. Be great when you need to be on those nights when we have to have this out of you. We need a 22 and 12 game tonight. You know, and, and you give them a seven and six game with five fouls. You give them one of that in a big spot. It's hard. It's hard sometimes to recover from that. So let's see where this leads. Overall, I like the move for New York. 
It definitely makes them, I think, more of a legitimate contender. A team, I think, that's got more talent now to compete compete with Boston. If they're healthy, I want to see what this looks like. Can they go toe-to-toe? And can the whole group handle the expectations of what's going to be placed upon this team if they get off to a good start, especially? And Tom Thibodeau has experience with Carl Anthony Towns. You know, there's some familiarity there that's either positive or negative or probably a little bit of both. Um, That was an interesting era in Minnesota. But – what do you think his role will be on offense? Because we know, obviously, with Jalen Brunson. That's I still think Jalen Brunson's the engine of that team. He's the guy that is the the his fingerprint is the loudest on the team. But Carl Anthony Towns took a major back seat this last year in Minnesota, and I feel like he doesn't need to do that anymore. And when you talk about lowering the usage rate of a Jalen Brunson, I actually think that they can have two offenses: the Jalen Brunson offense, cat fits into that pick and pops, pick and rolls, but maybe also the Carl Anthony Towns offense. And I'm just curious if you see him upping his usage over what we saw this last little bit in Minnesota and becoming more of a fulcrum. I do. And I also think last year, Carl Anthony Towns averaged 5.3 three-point attempts a game. I think he's going to shatter that this year. Mm. I think Carl Anthony Towns averages between seven and eight three-point attempts a game. It's an element to their offense that they didn't have before. I mean, as great as Isaiah Hartstein was, your guy, um, you know, that was a lot of pick, short dive, short roll. He had the little flip shot in the lane, right? He could all get get all over the offensive glass. Mitchell Robinson basically only a lob threat, yeah. um, and also all over the offensive glass. Carl Anthony Towns is different, and when you have Jalen Brunson operating ball screen the way that he can, and all, also by the way, another guy I want to mention, and I don't know if it's going to start off this way or what, but at some point, whether it's right off the bat or or, or not, I don't think it'll take too long. Tyler Kolek can mm. really play, man. Really, Tyler Kolek can play. Okay. And he is he is a guy I was so impressed with him in Vegas. First time I'd seen him in person. I loved him as a college player. I had not seen yeah. him until I was in Vegas and I, I called one of his games. His vision of of weak side of strong side to weak side with with delivering the basketball and on point with incredible crispness and just such decisiveness. Carl Anthony Towns is going to benefit from that too. So I think his three-point attempts are significantly greater than they've been. Uh, you, you know, I don't know if we'll get as many post-up attempts as like Julius Randle would get. We'll see. But I think Carl Anthony Towns represents a, a real threat now to utilize what Jalen Brunson, excuse me, brings to the table ball screen. And, and, and he's going to be able to find those spots on the perimeter right. where he can step out with space and be a really effective three-point shooter, three-point weapon at a higher degree than he's ever been in his career. The other you mentioned Tyler Kolick, which is interesting because to me the X factor on this team now is Miles McBride, because they had the, they as in the New York Knicks had a handful of players that obviously stepped up last year. You bring in OG Ananobi, Mikael Bridges, and you were Divincenzo as great as he was last year. Maybe became a little redundant when you put him to the bench, but when you leave when he leaves, Miles McBride last year was a guy that was really good a lot of the time and was not really good all of the time because he's young and still finding consistency. He's now part of their top seven or eight guys. Like they just need him to be good more consistently. And they need him to be what he was last year from the three point line. He shot 41% on four attempts a game. That is not in line with his first two years, 25 and 30%. So he's a guy that they're banking on the peaks. They saw are only going to become more and more the, the norm for him. Do you buy that with him? And do you agree that he's sort of a huge X factor for this rotation? I totally agree. Um, I think that he is, a, he's a guy that's going to get ample opportunity from day one. He, he's a, he's a crowd favorite already. Yeah. Uh, he can flat out score, man. He strings together buckets uh, so he can get it going. I think he's actually going to find great chemistry playing with Tyler Kolek. Tyler Kolek's going to make everybody on this team better because that's how he thinks he's, he's like a CPU on the way that he operates on the floor. Everything's about you first as a teammate. They're going to love playing with him. And I think Miles McBride's a guy that can really benefit from having the stability of a guy like Kolek. He's also left-handed, which is – it's interesting to me that they got another left-handed sort of stocky point guard, Like, and he's really strong. He's not like lightning quick. Either is Jalen Brunson. Neither one of these guys gets off the ground, right? They play similar style. Jalen Brunson is a much more significant scoring talent than Tyler Kolek. But my point with it is this. A lot of the stuff that you want to run is tailor made to having a left handed point guard. And now you've got a backup that I think, you know, you can just run the same stuff in the same spots, same sets, same spacing, same sides of the floor. 
he's he's gonna it, you know what I mean? it's just a natural thing for them it's, i don't think that's why they drafted him but i just think sure. it's a it's a sort of a, a a tangible benefit to drafting him is that and i think he's gonna make guys like miles mcbride better i think he'll make some of their shooters better and give them more time and space ananobi i think josh hart those guys playing with a guy like Kolek who delivers a ball exactly when it has to be delivered on on the right time and in the right place for you to get off a shot better. I just think it makes guys better, even if it's incrementally. That's a big difference in the NBA. Get ready for the season ahead with quality shades built to last. Our friends at Shady Rays have you covered with premium polarized shades that won't break the bank. Shady Rays is an independent sunglass company offering a world-class product rated five stars by over 300,000 people. Their shades have durable frames and crystal clear optics, making them a perfect choice for all outdoor activities. They have hundreds of options to choose from, so you're bound to find the perfect pair to match your style. They probably have a style in your favorite team's colors, no matter what type of sunglass you're looking for. So check them out right now. I've got sunglasses in my car. I've got them in my office and I have them at home. That way, no matter where I'm at, I can always get my pair of Shady Rays exclusively for our listeners. Shady Rays is giving out their best deal of the season. Head to ShadyRays.com and use our code AC35 for 35% off your polarized sunglasses. I'm telling you, winter coming up. If you're a skier, you're doing some outdoor activities, you're going to want to get some polarized sunglasses and you're going to want to support the show. So head to ShadyRays.com and use that code AC35 for 35% off polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself. The Shades rated five stars by over 300,000 people people. Also want to tell you about game time. We're just a couple of weeks away from the NBA season tipping off. You want to get your tickets at game time. They have an incredible interface to use where everything is so simple on the front page. You can hit that all in pricing. So you don't get surprised with all of these fees and taxes and everything else at the end. It'll just tell you the price, the final price of your ticket right there on the front screen. You can also search around the arena. You can look at the map view. You can experience what it looks like from your seat with the little 3D visual view from every single ticket. Ticket. And the best deal of all is you get those flash deals and last minute ticket pricing. So maybe you look at a game, it's sold out. You head on down, you park, you know the confidence you can have going to the arena without a ticket. You just hop on game time five minutes before and you're going to see those prices drop. Last minute ticket deals, flash deals, really incredible and a great way for you to sort of find the event you're looking for, or the NBA game you're looking for. Take the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code All NBA. That's A L L M B A for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create uh, an account and redeem the code A L L M B A for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. So the Knicks, we just talked about, very fascinating team, huge trade right before training camp. The other team that made big moves in the Eastern Conference this year or this summer was the Philadelphia 76ers who bring in Paul George as well as a host of other role players to fill out a pretty new roster, Pretty uh, quite a bit of turnover here. So right off the top, they have Maxi, Paul George, and Joel Embiid as a big three. I like that move, and I think it might be the best big three talent-wise in the entire NBA, what did you make of adding Paul George? Yeah, I totally get why you would do it. It's just, it's the, it's this is the best and most complete offensive talent that Joe Lambert has had around him. He's had yep. a couple guys that were great at the time when he had him early with Ben Simmons in what he did and, until he kind of fell apart psychologically and physically. James Harden, as talented as he is offensively, you can only play one way with him, and he struggled in the postseason. Paul George is is number one. He's 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 you know an element defensively that he brings you that's very important. He plays both ends of the floor. He likes to play defense. He's a guy that has got great length, great catch and shoot ability, um, or isolation ability. He can do either one of those things offensively. He has no problem letting the offense run through a bead for stretches. Maxi getting his opportunities and being the spot up three point shoot guy. As a catch-and-shoot guy, he can still do that at a really high rate. In fact, one of the highest in the league last year on catch-and-shoot percentage. So he can do that. Or, hey, Embiid's off the floor. We now have a guy that's a that's a that's you know been a number one on teams he's played on that's an all-star that we can put the ball in his hands. He's a great isolation and ball screen player. Let's do that. So they to me, this was – it made sense. The one thing that has to be answered is it's very simple. Two things. Joel Embiid has to be the same guy for the same amount of time over a postseason run that he is in a regular season. Plain and simple end of story. That means healthy right. and as productive. Yeah. And every night. Okay, so that's got to happen. And then Paul George 
he's same thing. He's had some tough playoff moments in his career. Yeah. And so, and now a lot like we talked about with New York and what I was saying about Carl Anthony Towns and the scrutiny, man, they're nothing like, I don't think there's anything like playing in Philly. Um, and, and the, the, listen, they'll love you if, if you're not afraid and you play hard and well for the most part in the postseason and you're tough, you're good in Philly, man. They, they relate to that. They'll forgive a bad night in a big moment. They won't forgive anybody who looks hesitant or they're not sure of themselves in a big moment. They, they yeah. that's hard to overcome in that city. So Paul George, and I don't think, and I don't think that's the case with him. But he's had some really bad shooting nights when his team needed him to be better in the postseason in his career. So you got two guys in Embiid and Paul George that have to answer a certain call yep. when the time comes because they're talented enough to challenge Boston and be the last team standing against the Celtics with that kind of talent, Adam. Those two guys are going to be in the spotlight. I don't doubt Maxi. I think Maxi is unaffected by that stuff. Really? I really believe it. I think Maxi is a carefree dude. He has got a smile on his face for a reason. It's genuine. He's having fun. He's unfazed by the pressure of the moment. And he's a breath of fresh air to everybody in that city. And Bede and Paul George are carrying a different level of baggage in the postseason. That's got to be addressed and answered. But here's the thing. I was just counting it. They added seven players. That are probably going to be in the rotation. Yeah, that's a I'm lot. I'm talking about a whole new Paul team. George, Caleb Martin, who might be their starting four, probably yeah. will be from I Miami. Like Eric Gordon. Yeah. Reggie Jackson. Yeah. Jared McCain, who they drafted in the yeah. first round. Draft Andre Drummond, who's now going to be their backup center. Again. And uh, Yabuselli, who made a name for himself in the Olympics. <laughs> Great Olympics. Olympic. Yabuselli, who's I think going to find time. I loved him when I saw of him in the Olympics. Yeah. Um, I think he's they're going to, he's going to find time. That's seven players you've added around these three, you know, the two big stars, uh, Maxi and Abid, going into the season. So that's a lot of turnover, man. And that we might have to wait a little bit to, to figure out who Philly is. Uh, it might be maybe it's Christmas by the time we know a little bit more about how this is fitting and all these pieces that they added, how they're all uh, their comfort level and how big of a threat they really are. And this is why the 76ers, this is the big question for them and why I find them so interesting. Are they going to build for the postseason almost exclusively? Because I think they're a good enough team when healthy that they should be a top four seed. I don't, you know, do you gun for the number one seed? Do you try to do this? Or do you try to arrive at the playoffs healthy and rested and all those things? And number two, have you developed all of your outs for the playoffs? Because I feel like there's that's there's a plateau of team, the contender tier, where that's what it's about. We know the three or four different styles of basketball we can play in a playoffs to get us through whatever series or whatever challenges throw our way. And my personal opinion is Philadelphia has not always done that in the last handful of years. Joel Embiid can win MVP again this year if he's healthy enough. But it might be that rather than that, they just need to develop, this is how we play in this configuration. This is how we play over here. You mentioned about Paul George can carry a, a lineup. Do you take a step back to allow him to have his space so we have that card in our pocket? That to me is the big question of the 76ers because I agree with you. They're really good. They make they have really interesting pieces, but I think it's going to take 82 games to figure out exactly who they are and only if they do things the right way. Yeah, no doubt. And it's look, it's you cannot deny you said maybe the this might be the most talented offensive big three in the league. I, I think that's a I think that's a really fair statement. And when you have that. You better be expecting to win a championship. Like it's it, right. forget some teams. You're going to say you know they still have Boston in the way, right? It, and a lot of teams just leave. You'd say that about. It. I don't think that Philadelphia should even think that way with those three players on their team. Um, the question is, can it blend? Does it fit? And then flat out, do they make shots and show up on nights that are the most meaningful in the postseason? That is what is going to determine how far they go. Um, um, let's move on now to actually, first, I just wanted to say Caleb Martin, Kelly Oubre, I actually really love the shooting is obviously going to be a question. Both of them are capable of shooting, but not consistent at shooting. I think those are two role players that I just, they're, they're definitely the, my type of role players and that they know their role. They can defend They're versatile. They're tough, but the shooting is really what it comes down to is in a playoffs. Both of those guys are probably going to get opportunities at swing series. They're capable of making them, but will they make them when it's just zero sum? Do you have any other thoughts on them? No, no, not really. I, yeah, I just think the Caleb Martin piece is big because of the toughness factor. 
He's tough. He guards. He's. He, I really like him. He's a good player. I thought that was a great pickup on their part to help round out their their starting five. I think when you look at um, Tobias Harris, who's been in that spot uh, over the last number of years, and the amount of criticism he took, and just in, in some ways, just he deflated. I think a lot of fans when Tobias, you know, would would, and I think some of it is unfair to be honest with you, but he did he also had some nice who just flat out non-existent offensively when they had to have it. Caleb Martin, I think, has a toughness about him that's going to translate well to the Philadelphia crowd, and he's going to thrive there. I think that's a really, really important, versatile addition, and you're going to play a little bit of a smaller lineup around Embiid, but I don't think that's going to they're going to give up much defensively when you added Paul George and Caleb Martin to that starting lineup. It's two guys that really like to defend. So I'm obviously very high on Philadelphia. Let's go now to my number one most interesting team, and that is the Orlando Magic. Probably not going to be everybody's most interesting team, but it certainly is mine. You know I love this young Magic team, and they add one of the best vets of the last five or six years in KCP, who I think is a perfect fit. They need it shooting. They're already a hard-nosed defensive team that has length and versatility. He just adds to that but brings in an element of shooting. They prayed, uh, I'm sorry, paid Franz Wagner early, which is always an interesting uh, move, despite the fact that he did not shoot the ball well last year, especially down the stretch, just 28% from three. But now they can go to a starting lineup of Jalen Suggs, KCP, Franz Wagner, Paolo Bancaro, Wendell Carter Jr., and they have a backup. Like they're dead. You talk about depth. Cole Anthony, Gary Harris, Anthony Black, Jonathan Isaac, Mo Wagner, when everybody's healthy, that's a 10 person rotation deep where I like all of the guys and I like the way they fit together. So I'm high on this team. And this would be my pick for team that surprises people and makes the biggest leap. You know, what's interesting is, Adam, I agree. This is a really interesting team. And the upside is just really fascinating because of their age of their top right. players, how young these guys are and how good they are already. Um, what's interesting is this is a total contrast to the team we just talked about because there's been not really any change at all besides KCP. Right. I mean, they're, they're basically running it back. Yeah. With the same guys. And then I don't know if Tristan De Silva makes the rotation or not. They did their, their first pick, the 18th pick in the draft, um, is a good player, but you know, rookie, who knows? But for the most part, like their top 10, very similar to what they had a year ago. So the question is for them, is what kind of leap do they take this year? Ben Caro is a legitimate star player. Like yeah. he, he he is a complete package. He is a great offensive player in this league. Um, Franz Wagner was their second best offensive player a year ago. Really struggled at the end of the year, including uh, I don't have it in front of me unless I can find it real quickly. The way his season ended was, uh, yeah, one for 15 in a game seven. Ugh. Um, right. So that's how Franz Wagner's season ended. But that doesn't, to me, encapsulate the year he had. It, he's a really good, versatile offensive player. When I first saw them early in the year, I was like, man, I don't know if, th if this is going to be good enough if, if these are your two guys. Ben Caro right. clearly answered that. Bogner, much better offensive player this early in his career than I ever thought he could be. They're the only team, Adam, last year, the only team in the NBA whose top two scorers were both 6'10 and up. They're the only team that operated that way. Two big forwards that handle the ball, shoot the ball, do pretty much everything. Suggs got better with his playmaking as the year went on and started making shots at a higher rate, being more consistent offensively. It was very important for their growth, and he's got to continue to do that. But one of their best selling points for this team is there a better on the ball defensive backcourt than Suggs and KCP now? Nope. Like this is as good as it gets in this league defensively with your top two guys and and their interchangeability and switchability. Man, what a luxury! So defensively, I think they got better. They're shooting around the two stars got better. Fight. I need to see a continued improvement out of Suggs and then some of the guys you mentioned just have to continue to grow. Anthony Black, um, Cole Anthony, Jonathan Isaac, you know. Uh, Wendell Carter, like these guys are still pretty young players. They need they need to continue to grow and and improve. And if they do, Orlando's got a real chance to be in the top four in the West. I mean, sorry, in the Eastern Conference. I just think defensively, there's so much upside. And you mentioned Jonathan Isaac, obviously an enormous health question mark. But if you could throw out lineups that featured Suggs, KCP, and Jonathan Isaac, I mean that you're not scoring on that group very yeah. often. And they have other pieces around that can do you know that can fill in the gaps. So that's why I like him. The thing I think here, and you mentioned Anthony Black, I think he needs to take a, a step because I have him penciled into the rotation this year, but maybe he shouldn't be. Um, the question I have for them is, I love depth. It's not that many teams I can rattle off 10 guys and say I like all of them in the rotation. 
but they are missing some shooting and probably a little bit of, you know, yeah. you know, some more just like creation, shot creation, but they have pieces to trade. And that's why I look at the Orlando magic. And I wouldn't be surprised if we got to the all-star break and they were a top three or four team in the, in the East, but just below the level where we take them serious. But if they make the right cons- uh, trade where they get some of these young pieces that they have and they get a win now piece that creates for them, I could just see them being a team that post all-star breaks shoots onto the radar of, hey, this team might actually have upset potential of those teams we're talking about, the Bostons, the New Yorks, and the Phillies. Uh, yeah, that's a great point. And I want to I want to just uh, uh, give some numbers to the first point you made about the shooting with this group. They were tied for last in the league mm. in three-pointers made per game Yeah, with the Detroit Pistons, who we know the year that they had. Right. So that, that's – that's typically where your Portland was was right ahead of them. We know what kind of year Portland had. So and there's a reason when you when you are trying to match threes with mid range twos, layups, and free throws, it, that's really tough. Just do the math on it in a league where teams are a lot of teams are taking 35 to 45 three point attempts. They took 31 a game and they made 11. Yeah. That is that is like old your generation three point shooting numbers. That's not modern. That has to improve Adam. If they really want to close that gap and be able to win nights, some nights you got to win the shootout games. You've got to win games like that. Yeah. And, and it might take make a 16, 18, 20 threes. You've got to have that ability. And, and they were challenged in that way. They just didn't have a roster like that. It's the same roster, basically running it back, except for KCP, who's going to improve your percentages but he, you know, he's not a super high volume guy. Maybe on this team he'll get more because of the makeup of the team as opposed to Denver. Maybe he gets more shot attempts per game. But Suggs has to be better in that regard. I think yeah. you know, Franz Wagner's got to be a little bit more consistent with his three point shooting. So there, there's a, that that is probably the greatest area of growth if you're looking at it from a team standpoint. Their three point shooting shooting makes per night. They might be my favorite trade target. Like whenever people are hopping on the trade machine all year. Just throw magic at the the magic in there because they have a lot of pieces to trade, and I think they can turn that ten person rotation into an eight person rotation down the stretch. That'd be really really scary. Um, and in many ways, they're this year's version of the Indiana Pacers. But this year's version of the Pacers are a lot like last year's version of the Pacers. They have a lot of running it back as well, uh, bringing back their guys. There are some question marks around them, but you had them on your list of most interesting teams. What is it about the Pacers this year? Get ready for the season ahead with quality shades built to last. Our friends at Shady Rays have you covered with premium polarized shades that won't break the bank. Shady Rays is an independent sunglass company offering a world-class product rated five stars by over 300,000 people. Their shades have durable frames and crystal clear optics, making them a perfect choice for all outdoor activities. They have hundreds of options to choose from, so you're bound to find the perfect pair to match your style. They probably have a style in your favorite team's colors, no matter what type of sunglass you're looking for. So check them out right now. I've got sunglasses in my car. I've got them in my office and I have them at home. That way, no matter where I'm at, I can always get my pair of Shady Rays exclusively for our listeners. Shady Rays is giving out their best deal of the season. Head to ShadyRays.com and use our code AC35 for 35% off your polarized sunglasses. I'm telling you, winter coming up. If you're a skier, you're doing some outdoor activities, you're going to want to get some polarized sunglasses and you're going to want to support the show. So head to ShadyRays.com and use that code AC35 for 35% off polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself. The Shades rated five stars by over 300,000 people people. Also want to tell you about game time. We're just a couple of weeks away from the NBA season tipping off. You want to get your tickets at game time. They have an incredible interface to use where everything is so simple on the front page. You can hit that all in pricing. So you don't get surprised with all of these fees and taxes and everything else at the end. It'll just tell you the price, the final price of your ticket right there on the front screen. You can also search around the arena. You can look at the map view. You can experience what it looks like from your seat with the little 3d visual view from every single ticket. Ticket. And the best deal of all is you get those flash deals and last minute ticket pricing. So maybe you look at a game, it's sold out. You head on down, you park, you know the confidence you can have going to the arena without a ticket. You just hop on game time five minutes before and you're going to see those prices drop. Last minute ticket deals, flash deals, really incredible and a great way for you to sort of find the event you're looking for, or the NBA game you're looking for. 
Take the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code All NBA. That's A L L M B A for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create uh, an account and redeem the code A L L M B A for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. I think they're hard to play against, and I think they're just going to be better. Tyrese Halliburton is is a super young player. I know he didn't have a very probably personally rewarding Olympic experience, although he seemed to make the most of it and bought in as a good teammate and and certainly, you know, tried to maximize the experience. But, I mean, that's got to be frustrating. He was he was the odd man out more than anybody else on that team. I don't think that should affect him going into the season. He's a really young player. He's an all-star caliber player that is even close to scratching the potential, I think, of what he could be. Um, he comes back. You re-sign Nemhart, who really, to me, showed his worth as a two-way player last year. Guy yep. can flat out score, and he's really good defensively on the ball. Uh, was not a great matchup for Jalen Brunson, um, but most guys, it, that's not a great matchup for. Um, Neesmith, you bring back, he's physical at the small forward position, can really guard, had a lot of impact for them. You obviously have Siakam. Here's the biggest question mark for Indiana going forward. Miles Turner is going into the last year of his contract. They've got to make a decision on, on on do they think they can resign him, will he resign, or do they just want to go to a different direction? Does he become trade material going into the trading deadline, and do they go in a different direction? I personally think he's a great fit for this group because he can make trail threes. He can, They play really fast up the floor. Halliburton really advances the ball. Miles Turner, a lot of times the last guy up the court, he walks into three-point shots all the time. He's a great pick and pop option with Halliburton because he can stretch out, but he can also catch it and one dribble to the rim from 25 feet and pound on somebody. So he's, he's, he's just, I think he's a very good offensive player. He's not the rim protector. He used to be as most guys are, uh, are not rather when they become better offensively. Um, you know, Sergi Baca case example, when guys make their name for themselves, blocking shots and protecting the rim. And then all of a sudden they realize that the real money comes from making baskets. they they don't ever quite regain that defensive prowess. So he's not as good there, and I think that's something they're looking to improve upon. But I still love Miles Turner fit with this team, but they got to make a decision on him and what's going to happen. I would look, be looking at that going into the year, and they're just rounding it out. You re-signed T.J. McConnell, who was fantastic for them in the postseason. Ben Shepard, really young player, got playoff love experience. Him. He's coming back. Here's the big X factor for this yep. team. Same, we Benedict same Matherin. One. Yep was just starting to like really come into his own in this league as a second year player missed the playoff run, missed all of that at the end of the year, you're adding back a guy that's like right off the bat, you know, 16, 17, 18 point per game scorer yeah. right away. And I loved him coming out and now he's hopefully he's healthy coming into the season. That's a major infusion of talent to a group that already went to the conference finals. So I, I love Matherin and then re-signed Obi Toppin. Still have Isaiah Jackson. You're right. They ran it back for the most part, but I think they still have a lot of guys that are growing. And then they've got this big question to answer around Miles Turner and what that's going to be going forward. And it's a huge question with Miles Turner because they just brought in James Wiseman, who, I mean, I'm not, I'm not making a bet on that he's going to stick around, <laughs> but that's it. I mean, your centers after, besides that, you don't really have center options. You're talking about having to play small. So that will be something to monitor and how they decide to go forward. But I agree with you about Benedict Matherin. The team played well without him. And more importantly, or equally as importantly to me, Nemhard is better than I expected him to be. And I imagine yeah. he's probably better than they expected him to be. And he's coming off of not just a great playoffs, but he's also coming off of a great Olympics. I thought he was fantastic for Team Canada at the Olympics. And I just look at that and I go, Benedict Matherin brings you some shooting and playmaking and, and scoring and all this stuff. But do they need it? They might not with how good Nemhart is, and Matherin might be a guy that is one of these guys that is a trade piece for them. We just talked about Orlando. They have some depth, but they yep. maybe consolidate. Benedict Matherin, to me, might be the piece that you lose to consolidate and make your roster a little bit more refined. And just given the success they've had, I, I kind of think that's how this plays out. I Listen, I, I think there's a, that's a good point because you've got a, if there's one dilemma for Rick Carlisle, it's who do you play and when and how yeah. much and what nights because they've got a lot of guys that expect to play. And you got five guards, Halliburton, Nemhart, TJ McConnell, Ben Shepard, Bennett Matherin. All yep. those guys like them all. are expecting to play. And Shepard probably be, would be lo the low man of the totem pole with this group. 
But Mathern last year, just under 15 points a game in 26 minutes and almost 45% from the field. That's super efficient for a two guard in limited in, in really limited minutes, 26 minutes a game, not super high volume of the shot total and still giving like 15 a game. And, yeah. and then he gets hurt, uh, played 59 games last year. It missed the end of the year. I can't wait to see what Benedict Matherin looks like coming back from this injury and, and what that what that talent means to this team and what, the, what are the decisions that Rick Carlisle has to make with a glut of guards um, and knowing that you got to make a decision on Miles Turner. You know, do you do you trade Miles Turner um, to add something else to your team that you need? Um, and knowing that you could always maybe move Benedict Matherin for a different big, or if that's what you wanted to do, or, or Nemhart or whatever. So they've got a lot of players that matter, and that is a good thing to have, but it's also difficult for the organization and for Rick Carlisle to figure out sometimes what the right chess pieces are to move. Miles Turner could be a good fit in Orlando. I keep looking at Orlando destinations because they're kind of my Eastern Conference side piece team, but he would make sense there. I don't know if there's the trade makes sense the other direction, though. I'd have to really work on that to find out. Um, with the Pacers, though, here's my last question about them. We see this all the time. They make a run to the conference finals, kind of ahead of schedule, a little bit of a Cinderella run, but now that's the expectation. We made it there, now we take the next step. But I look at this team and I go, I would not pick them to go back to the conference finals. And I would almost feel surprised if they were to do it with how much the Eastern Conference has a lot of good teams at the top. So would you be as surprised as I am to see the Pacers back there, given that they're more or less running it back? No, I wouldn't be as surprised as you, I don't think. Um, I do agree with you that they, 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 they're not going to be on anybody's list to make it there going mm. into the season. I agree with that because obviously Boston, everybody's going to have going back to be one of the last two teams in the East with what Philly did. They making a great claim for it. What the Knicks just did, like those teams, you still have Damian Lillard and Giannis in Milwaukee and they weren't healthy at the end of the year when Indiana beat them, those three teams, you know, and even, you know, just mentioned a really young upcoming Orlando team. You've got a Cleveland Cavalier team that yep, still Cavs has a lot of talent that, that won a first round series last year. So they're not, Indiana's not making anybody's list. And here, here's what I will say. I won't be as shocked. Because I think the way that they play is very difficult to stop. Yeah. And they it proved it that way last year in the regular season. It proved that way in the postseason. And a lot of people might say, oh, well, if the Knicks were healthy, they, they would have got by them. Well, guess what? We'll never know that, will we? <laughs> I do know that the Indiana Pacers yeah. style requires an incredible commitment defensively to be conditioned and to have multiple efforts sprint back talk through everything because the ball hops moves and it gets up the court quickly and they have a lot of guys that can make shots so i think listen what i just described is a formula that translates in any right. year i think indiana is a team that absolutely would be in the mix to do that now you got questions around philly and a beat staying healthy and paul george fit in philly right that those are question marks and seven new plate players in the rotation probably those are all question marks the Knicks got to figure this out with Carl Anthony Towns and make sure that works. And he's happy and it all works for them. And then they they had health issues. So let's prove it. Prove to me that you can stay healthy. Obviously, Milwaukee had a lot of questions even before the injuries at the end of the year. They were not very good defensively. Doc Rivers didn't make them better defensively. They didn't really do much around those guys to improve their roster. So there's question marks there. So, you know, I think there's less questions around Orlando and yeah. probably less questions around Cleveland, I think, than those three teams. So there's there's still th things there that need to be answered, and I feel like Indiana, they proved what they were. They stayed healthy, and they stayed together, and they got everybody back, and their young players are going to be a year better. So that's why I think, no, I won't be as shocked if they're in the mix and they ended up being there. I say that now. Here we are you know, sitting here in late September. Um, they haven't played any games yet. Let's see what all it right. looks like when all these teams get out there and they face each other. But I just think their style, Adam, gives them a chance. Yeah. The last team we're going to talk about in the East and our five most interesting teams is the Milwaukee Bucks. If you're new to the show, throw us a like, leave us a comment and let us know who your five most interesting teams in the East are. And also we're doing this five or four days a week, starting on October 14th, legs and I breaking down the night slate every single day uh, throughout the week. You're not going to want to miss it. So hit that subscribe button, but the Milwaukee Bucks, they signed a bunch of really high value, cheap deals. They got Gary Trent Jr., Torian Prince and DeLon Wright, all for veteran minimum deals. Those are good players for the price point they got. Gary Trent Jr. last year led the NBA in three-point field goal percentage on open threes. He shot 51.3%. 
amongst players to take at least one and a half a game. 51.3% on wide open threes. And now he's reunited with Damian Lillard. So I feel like that's an interesting move. But more to the point, the margin moves are great. The role players are great. The real question is, how much of an impact, in my opinion, how much of an impact does Doc Rivers have now that he gets a full season and a full camp to put a, a strategy together? And how much better can Damian Lillard be than what we saw last year now that he's a little healthier and he gets a full year also as a training camp? Those are my big questions and, and what I, how I look at them. Do you agree or do you have different things that you think are the top level topic for the Bucks? No, and, and, but, and some of those are similar. I'm going to expand on a couple of them. And I think that I'm glad they made this list. Because some people might not look at them that way. They may think, oh, okay, we've kind of seen the best of what Giannis is going right. to be. And the Bucks won their championship. And, and with all these other teams that we just talked about and the talent that they've added and are younger, like, yeah, what's interesting about the Bucks? The only thing I'll say to that is this. I love the pieces they added. You mentioned why. They, it's very difficult to get guys that have that kind of experience, that, if they're, that are specialists in their own right, that add that kind of value to your team for those prices. They got it, and they added three of them, and particularly Gary Trent Jr., the most important to me. With with and he guards too, by the way. He can guard and he can really shoot it. Um, and Torian Prince, both corner threes, and he can guard people. Th those are both assets in this league to go around this team. The biggest reason, though, I think that this is still a very interesting topic is because we do we have not come close to seeing what the absolute best of Damian Lillard can be in this situation. Last year was a tough situation. Yep. I said it from the very beginning. He had nights where he was spectacular, and his numbers yeah. still look pretty good. But there was also like, yeah, just not quite the same. Yeah. And the reason I think a big part of it was it's got to be different and a major adjustment for a guy for the first time in his life not being the best player on his own team. Yeah. And I think that that is, is – it takes – a serious amount of adjustment to your game and there's too much going on between your ears and you're not just instinctively playing when he was in Portland, everything started and ended with Damian Lillard. do whatever you want offensively. Everything revolves around you shoot it whenever you want from wherever you want. There's never a trace of doubt if this is a good shot for our team because you're Damian Lillard, you are the face of this franchise um, and one of the faces of the league, do whatever you want. And you get to Milwaukee, and it's like, yeah, okay, it, Giannis said it. Do that. Right? right. Adrian Griffin said that. Doc Rivers said that. Everybody says it, but you are you got this long shadow cast in front of you. Yeah. And it's just a different feeling for Damian Lillard. When you have a whole offseason and then a whole fresh year coming in, and he was going through some things personally too. We know that we're affecting yeah. him. and. If, if if some of those areas are more um, fulfilled in his life and he can maybe – it's less of a distraction, some of the things he was going through. And now you got a second year to embrace what this feels like and a, a full season with Doc Rivers and some of these nice pieces they added that can take pressure off of you defensively specifically. I think Damian Lillard's best is going gonna, is gonna to come here in Milwaukee. And so, and so as a result – it's very difficult to know what their upside is because the talent level of those two players is so special. Let's see if it's marginally better or, right. or significantly better than it was a year ago is fit with the honest. You got the, the East as another, as a team that's absolutely ch a challenger. And that's why they're still interesting to me. The only other thing I have about them is you look at the Eastern conference, you got Tyrese Maxey, you got Jalen Brunson. Um, you got some tough guards, Donovan Mitchell, really tough covers. And I don't know who their go-to is there. I would guess it's Delon Wright. But, you know, at the moment, you're talking about Middleton, Prince, Gary Trent Jr., Pat Connington, Delon Wright. One of those guys is going to have to pick up those assignments. And those aren't, oh, they're pretty tough to cover. Those are really tough pick-and-roll assignments. And I just don't think they have a guy that you feel confident is going to be able to, to crush that role in a playoffs. Well, I'll give you credit for this. You, you were on this early in the year last year. You said it right off the bat about Milwaukee. You said, at the end of the day, you didn't trust the defensive backcourt of Damian Lillard and Malik Beasley. Yeah. yeah. Right? You said, that's what you said repeatedly. 100%. So, and your point is this. Look, Damian Lillard, it's one of the luxuries he had in Portland because of what I just described and the freedom he had and, and just yeah. being regarded the way he was offensively and everybody knowing that at the end of the day, we, like, we need 30 tonight out of him. Then you're not really focused on some of the defensive 
um, inadequacies. You're, you're not really criticizing that or harping on that or worried about that or breaking that down because you're talking about them offensively. Well, now you come to Milwaukee and they already have a guy on that level offensively. Some of those things were brought to light a little bit more about yeah. Damian Lillard's defense and like how he could be taken out of a play with one simple screen. And then it's the last you see a Damian Lillard on that possession. Um, so it's really important who's next to him to take that pressure off of him to the extent that you can. And that wasn't, they didn't have that last year. Pat Connaughton's a good defensive player and he really competes. Right. And that's fine. Do you need something else? And I think DeLon Wright, Gary Trent Jr. And even Torian Prince, who's more of a small forward and not going to guard yeah. those, those guards as much. I think all of those guys help collectively take some of the pressure off Damian Lillard defensively where it won't be as glaring this year when we talk about their team defense because I think that was a big part of it. But when you look at the other teams in the Eastern Conference, they just have better guys at that. Yeah. Like I like DeLon Wright, but he's more of a role player spot. You know, you fill him in as your secondary defensive player. I yeah. think he would be great there. You spell somebody out. But the other teams just have guys that are better at that and they don't. And so to your point, they're going to have to be overwhelming and make you adjust but to do that, Damian Lillard's going to have to be a different player than the version we saw last year. And I kind of expect it. I actually think it was underappreciated the fact that he arrived there, just like Carl Anthony Towns is arriving in New York, and maybe we should consider it. He's arriving there as things are starting. There's not an adjustment period. You know, I imagine Carl Anthony Towns, does he have a, an apartment lined up? You're going right into camp, and you're probably living out of a suitcase for a little bit here. That's tough to do. So I think it's I think Milwaukee will settle a little bit this year, but I still think the holes in their roster are too too big. Uh, lastly, honorable mentions. You got anybody that we don't have to go into depth on, but just that you you think we're close to making this list for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the big omission here obviously is Boston because we both agree. Like, what what yeah. you know? What more can you say about Boston? You know, th th what's interesting to me about the Celtics though is it's very rare that a team breaks through, wins the title, gets the whole thing done dominates we all know that that means a lot of times you know hey it's really hard to replicate that that desperation right it, it's it's you know can you find that again um and your off season is different you know and for everybody everything feels different when you've already won it what's interesting about this group is their two best players have a ton of motivation for different reasons. That's so true. <laughs> and you don't see that very often, man. Yeah. Like the fact that Jason Tatum could finally win a championship as being regarded as one of the, you know, one of the best players yeah. in this league and wins a championship, doesn't win finals MVP, and then gets, you know, is one of the other guys besides Halliburton. Like it's kind of like that guy that, that did not get the playing time or whatever the opportunity and everybody else did on the Olympic team. And a lot was made of that, yeah. I, including by myself. Because yeah. I thought I, it was head scratching that. Yeah, you hated it. Made, that it happened to him. We talked about it over the yeah. summer. But so he's obviously got a lot of motivation. And then Jalen Brown was left off the team. Yeah. And Jalen Brown saw two of his teammates, other yeah. than Jason Tatum, play right. on that team. Yeah. So it's very rare that a team can win it and have their two best players, who you would assume led them to the title, which they did, actually be really motivated coming into the season because there's still a lot for them to prove yeah. that that to me is the best thing going for the Boston Celtics and that's why they're still interesting to me and in what kind of year those two guys have and what their tone is night to night the only other two teams that I think would have made this list for me was Cleveland who gets yeah. a new coach I mean they're running it back but they have a new coach um, which is really interesting uh, I thought maybe they'd be a team that split up their big, split up their backcourt. They did not. Instead, they just bring in a new coach and how much of a difference will he make? But then Charlotte, to me, was the only other team, maybe a little bit further down the list. That, to me, is really interesting because talent-wise, they have some interesting pieces. Direction-wise, they have interesting options. And I, I, this is a team to me that I wouldn't be surprised if they take a bit of a leap. But they're also so immature that they haven't proven to do that yet. So what do you think of Charlotte? Very good point. Also a coaching change, but like, listen, you got a super talented point guard. Um, yeah. LaMelo Ball is, is box office, man. He's fun, entertaining. He makes guys better. Uh, he's super talented. Um, so I think that's a team that based on the talent, they're going to have, they're going to have an uptick, man. They had a terrible year last year and it was injuries and everything really else. Bad. And, yeah, just you know, personal stuff. They had stuff off the court, legal, pro all kinds of stuff going on. They, they, if they, they've got a new coach and they've got a different approach, 
then this is a team that's got talent that's going to be very interesting. So I think that's a good one. The only, only other one for me that I had written down was Miami. Just because it's like, is is are we done like caring about the Heat? <laughs> well, so they, they've been like unimpressive all this time, and then they keep having impressive playoff runs. And last year was the first year where it was like, okay, that's what we thought. The playoffs matched our expectations. So maybe everybody moves on. But what do you think? It's like I think it's we're we're kind of at that point, and I think it's going to be yeah. interesting to see like what do they do with this group? I'm just looking at their roster. I mean, Terry Rozier. Yeah, you know, he didn't have a full season with them last year. Then he got hurt, and, and that's you know that's that's a tough thing to sure. fit in. Maybe he plays really, really well this year. Coming into the season is a different look when you've had a training camp with the team and you know the guys a lot better and the coaching staff. It's just different uh, rather than doing it on the fly. So maybe there's you know he's a lot better. Um, Jovic is a guy that's going to be better mm, this year, yeah. man. And again, he had he had Olympic experience that probably really beneficial to him. Yeah. And he's a very talented young player, so he could have a significant improvement in his impact uh and then Jaime Hawk has had a great year last year as a rookie so he's you've just figures to get better so I think there's some things there to watch for them but the question is always going to revolve around those other guys Hero yeah. Butler and Adebayo like have we seen the best of what that looks like and if that's the case they're not interesting I but that's if where other I guys elevate and there's more there for them then they're going to be in there'll be there'll be a team that you're we're going to be talking about all years like, oh yeah. watch out for the heat like that just seems like that's where they always are. And last year they didn't answer that bell at all. Yeah. So that's why to me I put them on this list as a, one more team that you just don't want to quite forget about yet. Well, let us know in the comments below if you agree or disagree with any of our takes and who your top five most interesting teams are in the Eastern Conference. That's it. This is our last week of the offseason. We're going to be back on the 14th with our regular scheduled programming. You're not going to want to miss it. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, every single week, breaking down all the latest news and notes. Legs, I can't wait for it. Me either, Adam. It's going to be a great year, man. And uh, let's get this thing rolling.